how I would describe this class is how to think biblically. What does that mean? There are lots of moral issues in this life that you are going to be faced with. Some issues uh, are, will be immediate, others you'll never have to worry about. I doubt, unless one of us winds up on a jury, I don't think any of us have to worry about capital punishment or if we decide to hold up a liquor store and shoot someone. But it's all really the same thought processes. How do you think biblically about the world around you? So I wanted to take, start this by taking something that is a social public issue. People talk about it all the time. And then sort of address how I hope you will be able to think about this as a mature Christian. Now, let me first start off by saying there are differences within the Christian worldview. There are some churches that believe that you do what they say. In other words, whether you go to the first fundamentalist Baptist church of Okeechobee and you do what the pastor says, otherwise you're ex expelled forever, or this is the magisterium of the Catholic Church and there's no argument. There's some people like that. And our church, the Episcopal Church, is not like that. And what, how we operate is more of a sense that we, provide, we accompany you on that journey. We're not one voice among many. You should listen to us first, but we're not going to tell you how to think. We're going to point to you the sources of truth, which are the gospel. We'll point to you what the tradition is, but at the end of the day, you make up your own mind. So, if you ask the question, what does the Episcopal Church think about capital punishment? It thinks everything. You, can, you have people on this side, you have people, you have people going, oh, you're protesting out from the prison in Stark, and you've got other people holding up signs saying, fry them! Now, I think I told you uh, last year, I was asked by a parishioner's daughter to come with her to an anti-death penalty rally at the courthouse in Inverness. <laughs> now, I personally happen to think the penalty is appropriate in certain cases. But I went, but I took off my collar. And I told her I was going not to support anti-death penalty, but to support her because she had come to a rational biblical decision that she believed it to be wrong. My job, in essence, was not to say, here's the answer, but rather, here are, here's the, in other words, I wanted her to show her work in her homework. Have you ever heard that, fellow? <laughs> Show your work and your homework, not just write down the answer. Think how you come to your conclusion. <clears throat> now, the thing I've printed out to you is not a lecture, but it's three or four different pieces of uh, information. And I'll touch upon these, uh, but I'm not going to read this or go through this point by point. <laughs> the first is from the Prison Fellowship. That's an organization run by Chuck Colson, uh, who does ministry in prisons. It's about death penalty, and this is sort of a balance, pro and con among the scriptures, under what conditions. Then there's a statement by the National Association of Evangelicals. Then there's a statement uh, about the Catholic Catechism on the death penalty. And then there's a criticism of the new statement by a Roman Catholic traditional scholar. So let me start off uh, by saying, why is the death penalty in the issue? Well, in August, Pope Francis changed the catechism of the Catholic Church. The catechism of the, we have a catechism in the back of our prayer book. Our catechism deals with matters of faith and salvation, the Trinity, the Old and New Testament, things that are specifically tied to the Christian doctrine of faith. The Catholic catechism, ours is like four or five pages. The Catholic Catechism is its own book, and it addresses issues beyond issues of faith. So there are a long, detailed discussions in the Catechism of abortion, homosexuality, capital punishment, three hot-button political issues. What does our Catechism say about any of these? Not a word. Now, is it because we just don't care? No. But we believe our church traditionally, historically, has believed that you are to be given the tools to make up your own mind, not for us to give you the answer and you follow it blindly. 
Uh, that's probably would be considered unfair, uh, my characterization, but it's my class, so I could say it. <laughs> now, in August, Pope Francis introduced the new catechism. And I'll read you part of it. It's sort of all, it's almost at the back. The new catechism of the Catholic Church says the death penalty. They have a section called the death penalty. It's paragraph 2,267. The course to the death penalty on the part of legitimate authority following a fair trial was long considered an appropriate response to the gravity of certain crimes and an acceptable, albeit extreme, means of safeguarding the common good. Today, however, there is an increasing awareness that the dignity of the person is not lost even after the commission of a very serious crime. In addition, a new understanding has emerged of the significance of penal sanctions imposed by the state. Lastly, more effective systems of detention have developed which ensure the due protection of citizens, but at the same time do not definitively, definitively deprive the guilty of the possibility of redemption. Consequently, the church teaches in the light of the gospel that the death penalty is inadmissible because it is an attack on the inviolability and dignity of the person, and she works with determination for its ab abolition worldwide. So Francis has changed the teaching of the Catholic Church. He can do that because he's Pope. Not everybody agrees with him. But he has now said it's inadmissible. Now, for Catholics, this is causing a tremendous headache. Why? Well, because the, the Popes in the 1950s and 60s said Catholic, the death penalty is entirely appropriate. In fact, Francis has basically said the other Popes are wrong. St. Augustine is wrong, Thomas Aquinas is wrong, the Church Fathers are wrong. The Church, the Catholic Church's tradition has always been that death penalty is justified based upon scripture, but an extreme and it has to be used sparingly and appropriately. Francis is saying we've now progressed to the point where we don't have to do that anymore and it was wrong and you can't do it anymore. So within the Catholic Church, the people who are fighting Francis over his other statements have now added a death penalty to the issue that he is wrong about, if you will. Now, the Episcopal Church, every so often, its general convention will issue statements saying, oh, we think the death penalty is wrong. Guess what? That doesn't matter. Je death penalty, um, statements from general convention about social issues are a statement, the mind of the general convention at that moment. The next general convention can say something completely different. What guides our doctrine and discipline and which grants us freedom to disagree is that our faith is based upon the Bible and through the liturgy we have in the Book of Common Prayer. And both of these, the Book of Common Prayer is, has one little statement about the death penalty. It's in this section called the Art Articles of Religion. It says that the magistrate may sentence people to death. The state has that right. Now that was written because at the time there were extreme Protestants who said that you can never have the death penalty because the Bible says thou shalt not kill, therefore the state may not kill. Well, the church, the church at the time responded, you're mistranslating, which originally in English it should really be thou shalt not do murder, which is different from thou shalt not kill. Now, so that, that's the only statement we have in the Book of Common Prayer, where the state may impose the death penalty. That was written in the 1600s, so people may say, oh, well, that was then, this is now. And then, what does the Bible say? Well, let's look at this first section from the prison ministry. It's called the death penalty. Now, the way this is divided, it says it's in... Uh, Pro and con, and we'll just touch through this. And scripture mandates capital punishment. This is where it says you must have capital punishment. Now, what are the arguments in favor of that from the Bible? The first is Genesis 9, chapter 6. Whoever sheds the blood of man, by man shall his blood be shed. For the image of God has God made man. This is part of the covenant with Noah, made after the flood. 
and it reflects the value given to human life. If you kill somebody, your life is subject to forfeit as well. Basically, that's as clear-cut as it gets in the Bible. If you kill somebody, your, you, your life is forfeit. Uh, it has universal application. And basically, that's very straightforward. Now, number two is the law is given to Moses on Mount Sinai, ordained execution for several offenses. Murder, but not manslaughter. Deliberate, willful murder. Striking or cursing a parent, kidnapping, adultery, incest, bestiality, sodomy, rape of a virgin, witchcraft, incor incor incorrigible delinquency. Oh, they should use that in middle school, shouldn't they? <laughs> Breaking the Sabbath uh, for people who don't come to church. Blaspheming, sacrificing to false God, oppressing the weak, and other transgressions. So the, uh, Moses' law on Sinai has the death penalty. Mo in other words, no, uh, in speaking to God, uh, in God speaking to Noah, when the law was given, God said to Noah, you may do this. This is why. And in Mo on Sinai, God tells him, God gives the instructions when to do it. When to use the death penalty. Now, in the New Testament, it has no statements mandating capital punishment. See, it's the difference between the Old and the New. Leviticus, if you do X, here's the penalty. Jesus doesn't say anything about that, nor did the apostles. Uh, for in Romans, Paul calls his readers to submit to the authority of civil government, reminding them that if you do wrong, be afraid, for the authority does not bear the sword for nothing. In other words, in its ultimate use, this word sword implies execution. Now, one of the things early Christians faced was when they were civil servants. They had joined a new religion, uh, they had committed their lives to Jesus Christ, they understood God's love, uh, you know, we must love our neighbors ourselves, yet they were soldiers, they were magistrates, they had real jobs. How do they live in the Roman world and remain Christians? This was a major, major issue. Some of the early saints, for example, were Roman soldiers who refused to kill and because of that, they, in other words, oh, let, you know, I order you to massacre this innocent village just because we need to terrorize the inhabitants. Sort of things the Nazis would do in Poland. You know, go kill these people as a show. And there are some Christian saints, whose names I'll remember after we're done talking, I forget right now, who refused and were executed. Or there were magistrates who had a murderer and they had to issue, to issue the death penalty. Could they do that? And so the early church, first, second, third, fourth centuries, had to wrestle with this figure, with this issue. And in the, third, in the fourth century, the pope gave a, gave a response to a Roman magistrate, a Roman judge. He had to sentence criminals to death. Could he do this? And the answer was, you need to distinguish the authority of the state from the authority of God. In your personal dealings, in your own life, and how you live as a human being, you must follow Jesus' example. But as an instrument of the state, and, if this, and we must honor the state, we must carry out the state's actions, you can do things that you personally would not approve of, but in the name of the state. So you may impose a death penalty as a judge. Now, what's the problem with that thinking? How can, where can that go if you go if you take it too far? Well, we saw that in World War II, didn't we? Not all Germans were Nazis. Some of the people who carried out the Holocaust were good Christians, but why did they do it? They were obeying orders. You see, and in other words, if you, where is the line between I'm obeying a law, an order from my superior, to I cannot violate the laws of God. Does anybody want to find that line for me? That's tough. That's really a tough well, question. Well, let's, let's ask the military expert.
Do you have to obey all orders or lawful orders? You have to obey only lawful orders. If the, if the order is illegal, then following the order is illegal. What would be an illegal order, you know? Shoot well, up this village. Shoot up the village to commit murder. Um, to uh, uh, detonate a weapon uh, that uh, is not the intended use of that weapon. So, uh, in, I know in, uh, in military, I never got that far. I never got past uh, basic training. Uh, There's a reason for that. reason for that, yes. <laughs> they didn't want to put me in anything that would float or blow up. Uh, <laughs> you know, there are classes on ethics, mm -hmm. how you behave. Because you basically you have power of life and death in your hands, and you cannot just exercise that and justify that by saying, "Well, might is right, and the state says I can do it, and I had an order to kill people." So this is a really this is people spend their lives studying this issue, but it's one that's been with us from the very beginning. From the very beginning, there have been Christian soldiers and Christian judges and Christian people who carried out executions, and the church has said to them, if you are doing this in a lawful, just way, it is permissible to execute criminals. It is permissible to serve in the military. Because the military, military service, at the end of the, you know, we need to view that as a just and proper use of military force, of defense. We live in a fallen, broken world. If we lived where everything was hunky-dory and daisies and there were no bad people, this would be an issue. But we don't live in that world. And we have military in an ideal world to protect our country. Now, in a fallen, broken world, we have a military like, say, the German, you know, we have a military to conquer other people. That was, I think I shared with you earlier in the, early in the year, that uh, during the Second World War, a number of Roman Catholic officers went to the Pope in Rome and said, look, here's what Hitler's doing. Here's what he's doing in Poland. Here's what he's doing in Russia. He's killing Jews. He's killing Catholic priests. He's doing all this stuff. And the only way it's going to stop is if we kill Hitler. And the Pope gave the sanction for the assassination of Adolf Hitler. So that Klaus von Stauffenberg, the man who actually put the bomb under the table that tried to kill Hitler, knew that his murder of Adolf Hitler, attempted murder, was blessed beforehand by the church. That's a real, that's hard to get your head around, isn't it? You know? But again, when you're dealing with Nazis, it's an easy decision. But let's put it down more into our own lives. You know, um, we have a parishioner, uh, Who's on, who actually is on duty today. He's a deputy sheriff. He's driving around, and it, he is trained when to use his gun. And when does he use his gun? To protect and to serve the community. He doesn't, if he's got a fleeing bandit, he's not allowed, it's not like Dragnet where he can shoot the bad guys, he's running away. You shoot to prevent what? Him harming other people. You see the distinction? But that has been a developing understanding of how we use force. So let me get back to this before I get too far down in the rabbit hole. When does scripture prohibit capital punishment? Now, the Old Testament, we can't find it because it clearly mandates it. For those who believe scripture prohibits have to look at the development from the New Testament, from the Old Testament to the New. Now, the first argument is Israel was a theocracy, a nation ruled directly by God. Therefore, its laws, well, its law was unique. Executing false teachers and those who sacrificed to false gods are examples of provisions that sprang from Israel's unique position as a nation of God called to be holy. When Israel ceased to exist as a nation, its law was nullified. Even the execution of murderers stemmed in part from God's special relationship to Israel. Numbers 35 says that the blood of a murder victim pollutes the land, a pollution that must be cleansed by the death of the murderer. If the murderer could not be found, an animal was to be sacrificed to God to purge the guilt of the community, purge the community of guilt. The second argument is that Christ's death on the cross ended the requirement for blood recompense and blood sacrifice. The sacrifice of Jesus, the Lamb of God, replaced the sacrifice of animals. 
His death also made it unnecessary to execute murderers to maintain human dignity and value because the crucifixion forever established human value. Hebrews 9 says, How much more then will the blood of Christ, who through the eternal spirit offered himself unblemished to God, cleanse our consciences from acts that led to death, so that we may serve the living God? And then the third argument, Christ's teaching emphasizes forgiveness and willingness to suffer evil rather than resist it by force. This may not be definitive on the issue of the state's authority to execute, but it does demonstrate a different approach to responding to evil than that established on Mount Sinai. Christ's example is not demanding death for the adulteress supports this argument. So what they're saying in this point is that Jesus takes the law and he doesn't cancel it, but he fulfills it in himself. He is the sacrifice that is required to pay for the sin. In other words, the Old Testament, the argument goes, required an eye for an eye, a tooth for a tooth, which is proportional. In other words, if you knock somebody's eye out, you can't kill them in return. You have to, the punishment must meet the crime, which actually was an advance on society. You know, the old-fashioned vendetta society, you bring a knife, I bring a gun, in other words, it just escalates. An eye for an eye was used to level things out. But Jesus is saying, I'll give my eye instead of you taking it from another person. And so that argument is that in Christ, we don't need to exact retribution or vengeance because vengeance is mine, says the Lord. So do you see where the arguments are going there? We have very clear argument in the Old Testament, and then we have not straightforward, but we have what I would call theological arguments. People are taking the Bible and saying, okay, if this is what the Bible says, this is how I understand it. So it's a different level. The Old Testament, black and white. The New Testament is sort of, if A and B, then C. In other words, they're making a conclusion, whereas the Old Testament, A is A. Now, let's jump to the next. Scripture, scripture permits capital punishment. Those who argue the Bible permits capital punishment see strength in both the pro and arc arguments, but to disagree with the conclusions. Argument one. As noted previously, Scripture includes many provisions for capital punishment. But Moses limited the scope of Genesis. For example, individuals guilty of manslaughter or causing another's death were exempt from the death penalty. In other words, if you, if you uh, in, our, in the state of Florida, if you co commit vehicular homicide, you kill somebody behind the wheel while you're drunk, you don't get the death penalty. You still go to prison if found guilty. But that is not a capital crime. Um, in Cap Florida, the capital crimes essentially are murder and uh, I think kidnapping still, but I don't think. I think it's. Uh, um, but I don't think people have been executed for kidnapping in a long time. Uh, some people may remember this, but does anybody remember the name of Carol Chessman? Carol Chessman was on the cover of Time magazine in 1961. I wasn't born yet, so I don't remember. But Carol Chessman was what I would call the sort of criminal they would have on Dragnet. He was a rapist, he was an armed robber, he was a kidnapper, and he was finally arrested by the police in Los Angeles. He'd been spent more than two-thirds of his life behind bars, and he was finally arrested after he committed a series of particularly vicious rape kidnappings. This guy was a monster. And Chessman was found guilty, and he was sentenced to death for rape, because in California, at the, at rape and kidnapping, because at that California, kidnapping was punishable by death. And Carol Chessman was the subject of massive anti-death penalty campaign. It really was the start of the modern movement in America to end the death penalty. And, they, and the, uh, those opposed to the death penalty picked Chessman because he never actually killed anybody. He would just rape and kidnap women. And he eventually was executed in the gas chamber in uh, San Quentin, 
but not till it went up to the Supreme Court and back down and all this and that. And it made the cover of Time Magazine. It was a suburb, subject of lots of civil rights marches and really put the death penalty in the public eye. And the new governor of California, Jerry Brown's father, a man named Pat Brown, said, I'm not going to execute anybody on my watch because, you know, that's a step too far. And it started the modern movement to abolish the death penalty, which reached its height. In, and remember, in the 60s in California, who was the most famous death penalty case in California in 1968? Manson. Charles Manson. Charles Manson, uh, Leslie Van Pouten, uh, Patricia Krenwinkel, uh, Susan Atkins. There were three girls and, and uh, uh, one man named Tex Watson. And Man Manson, all sentenced to death for their part in the Tate Le Bianca murders, particularly gruesome, horrible murders. And when the Supreme Court banned the death penalty, they were all sentenced to life in prison. And here's a funny aside. Manson died uh, earlier this year, unrepentant to the end. Uh, but every other one of those people I mentioned, while in prison, and they're all still in prison except for one who died. They're all still in prison, have all become Christians, and have all become in pastors within the church. So one of the arguments against the death penalty is that people can and do reform, and prison is a terrible place. I would want wish it on anybody, but at least they're called, they're doing something productive and helpful in their lives. Then you point to Charles Manson, who didn't do a good thing his entire life. How do you decide when both, in other words, how do you, and so people say, how do, you know, how should we decide? We have these three women and one man who all become Christians while in prison and have genuinely reformed. <coughs> Nobody doubts that. They're never going to get parole because of the notor notoriety of their cases. It's just not going to happen. And then Charles Manson, who has no regrets whatsoever. He'd do it, and again, in a heartbeat if he could. How do you decide at the time without the benefit of 40 years waiting? And so some people say we need to err on the side of caution and allow them the opportunity to repent. Well, let's take it a different direction. You read about these cases, Texas executes people. Texas executes a third of all the people killed in the United States uh, under capital punishment. They have executed, since the death penalty was reinstated, they've executed about 150 people. They're fairly regular about it. Um, Florida is up there too. Uh, most of the northern states do not execute. Most of the southern states do. Um, in Texas, you have a lot of people that the newspapers report have these sort of at the end conversions. And they still get it. They still get lethal injection, I think they do in Texas. And the argument says, well, now that they've asked God for forgiveness and repented, shouldn't they be let off? Now, why is, what's the answer to that? You know, God may forgive you, but you still have to pay for the consequences um, in a minor way. My daughter will occasionally call me, Daddy, uh, I've overdrawn my bank account and my checks are bouncing. Well, I'll cover her bank account, but I'll make her pay the overdraft fees because she had, needs to have some understanding that there are consequences to your ex. I'll forgive her, I'll take care of it, you know, I'm a sucker, I'll do, you know, whatever that baby wants, baby gets, but still, there needs to be some idea of consequences. So, Father George. Yes. Um, one of the one of the problems today that wasn't the situation 50 years ago is DNA, because mm -hmm. we see many times where men or women in prison that have been convicted of murder and are waiting capital punishment, a DNA, for some reason or some way, comes up to prove that the DNA at the murder scene was different than that of, the, mm -hmm. of those accused for murder. So some of those that are against capital punishment, 
to date, it may not have been 50 years ago, used the DNA example of innocents that had probably been, been killed. Uh, you, you've raised an excellent point, and I'm going to jump back to the National Association of Evangelicals statement. And because one of the things they say is that members of our organization are both in favor and opposed. So they have to basically take this position. Uh, one of the things they say, unfortunately, all human systems are fallible. Studies of the death penalty have indicated systematic problems. These include eyewitness error, coerced confessions, prosecutorial misconduct, racial disparities, incompetent counsel, inadequate instruction to juries, judges who override juries that do not vote for the death penalty, and improper sentencing of those who lack the mental capacity to understand their crime. In the first decade of the 21st century, 258 wrongfully convicted people have been exonerated due to the introduction of DNA evidence. 20 of these were serving time on death row, another 16 have been convicted of a capital crime but not sentenced to death. So here's Bob's point. Uh, we know, scientifically, that eyewitnesses make mistakes. Um, this isn't a politically incorrect thing, but it's harder for me to identify among different black people a person I saw than it is for white, unless I live in a black society. It's harder for a black person to just, you know, you know the nasty little saying, they all look alike. I mean, you, you go to China and you see all these people, I can't tell them apart. The Chinese come to America, they can't tell them apart. And the eyewitness identification across racial lines is difficult. It's not. That doesn't mean you're always wrong. It also means, uh, and we have judges and we have prosecutors who just go for the conviction, who withhold evidence. We've had a lot, we, not a lot, but we hear time and again of corrupt judges and prosecutors and police who basically want to close the case. Um, and as my wife would tell you as a lawyer, most lawyers are pretty crappy lawyers in the sense that they just do it for the fee. They're not really invested in their client. And if, you're up on, if you have a public defender, fortunately, he's got maybe 150 other clients, and you've got 20 minutes of his time, and he's going to try to get a plea bargain just to get you off his books. That doesn't mean he's a bad lawyer, but just the reality is he doesn't have you're not hiring Perry Mason, who can send a private detective and spend weeks looking into your case. If you, have, if you want to disprove DNA evidence, you have to have some the money to pay a lab. So, those, so people who make that argument are saying that the system is, can and does make mistakes. We have evidence of that. Therefore, we should err on the side of caution and not execute, just in case we've made a mistake. Now, let's jump to the other side, which says, well, we don't need evidence of DNA evidence for Charles Manson, or, oh, let's think of some, uh, my wife, I think I've told some of you this story. My wife, Susan, when she was a new lawyer, once represented the wife of a mass serial killer. Philadelphia, we have had a man named Gary Heitnick. And Gary Heitnick was a school teacher who would murder prostitutes and bury them in the basement of his house in Philadelphia. And he married to a woman, and they had a child, Gary Heitnick Jr. And Gary Heitnick was eventually captured by the police, and he's serving like an 800-year sentence in the Philadelphia, in the greatest prison in Philadelphia. And Susan and his wife wanted to get a divorce and change her name. I wonder why. Uh, and Susan had to convince the judge to allow, grant the divorce because Heidnick, the, the state of Pennsylvania, would not allow him to have a pen to sign the divorce decree because he was in one of these Hannibal Lecter things that if you gave him a pen or a fork or a spoon, he'd attack you. And Susan never quite had the nerve to ask her client, the wife, what were you doing while he was in the basement all this time? Gary Heidnick was guilty without a shadow of a doubt. He murdered, I think, eight, nine, ten people. Um, 
Pennsylvania didn't have the death penalty then. If that were Florida, he'd be on death row. There's no, you know, how certain do you have to be to be certain? You, you see what I'm saying? How certain do you have to be about a Charles Manson or some of these monsters? Because there are human monsters that do this. Let, let's hop back there. New to, okay, let me get back to the Bible section, because that's what I want to focus on. Perhaps the most compelling example arguments against capital punishment are the examples of criminals who were not executed in the Bible, such as Cain, Moses, and David. Remember, Cain murdered Abel. And God put the mark of Cain on his forehead and said to the world, you may not hurt this man. He has my mark. He has murdered his brother. But you may not take revenge. Moses, Moses murdered the Egyptian overseer. And that's why Moses was not allowed into the promised land at the very end. He died on the outskirts of Israel. And his grave we, is not, we know not where, the Bible says. And David, David sent Bathsheba, uh, David sent Uriah the Hittite. David organized a, a murder, murder for hire of Uriah the Hittite. Yet he was not executed. And not only did Jesus refuse to condemn the woman caught in adultery, but he also suggested that only those without sin were qualified to perform the execution. In other words, there was a woman who had been caught, as the lawyers say, in flagrante delecto. The detectives barged into the room while they were at it. And the man must have escaped out the window, but they got the woman. And she was caught in, adul caught in adultery, in the act. And that, under the Mosaic law, was a death penalty. And Jesus said to them, you know, if you, 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 those of you who are without sin, not just the sin of adultery, but any sin, you can be the one to throw, first, throw the first stone. And Noah and Jesus, sort of his moral authority, won the day. But then he turned to the woman and said, and go and sin no more. It wasn't that it's okay, but rather, you've had a break, sister. Cut it out. So, so... Jesus, Jewish interpretation of the Old Testament law reflected a great reluctance to impose a death penalty. For example, the circumstantial evidence wasn't admitted. In numbers, two eyewitnesses had to have warned the accused he was about to commit a capital crime. If the two witnesses' testimonies differed, the accused was acquitted. Men presumed to lack compassion could not rule on a capital case. So let's think about that. If we've been watching the newspapers and reading the newspapers lately, what are some people saying about Judge Kavanaugh? He doesn't have a judicial temperament. He gets angry. Now, I don't want to talk about that issue, but that's actually a biblical issue. It's not a dumb argument. It may not be appropriate to this instance, but the Bible says if you're a hot-tempered man, if you can't be compassionate and, and, and calmly evaluate the situation, you can't serve on a jury that gives out the death penalty. Which is a remarkable statement about a group of people who lived 3,000 years ago. I mean, it's, it's remarkably advanced and civilized. Or, you cannot be executed for murder unless two people saw you do it and told you not to do it before you're about to do it. So yes, the, uh, there were penalties for death, but you had to have this degree of certainty, which is actually more strenuous than we have today. Because nobody told Charles Manson not to do it. You, you see where I'm going with that? But that's any capital crime back in Numbers 35, not just murder, correct? Yes, any okay. capital crime. Okay. So, like, you, uh, if you... Uh, you committed blasphemy. Mm -hmm. Struck your parents. Struck your parents. There had to be witnesses. Had to have warned you. Had to, don't, 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 don't touch nothing. Don't do it. Okay. You'd still be in trouble. I mean, death, that wasn't, you get off scot-free, but still death penalty was reserved because the Jewish law presumed that when you shoot, that if you've been warned and told not to do it, you still go and do it, you have then made a conscious decision 
to take another person's life. Wasn't an accident, wasn't the heat of the moment, you weren't involved in a fist fight, you know, it wasn't something like that. Premedicated. It was premedicated, planned exam. Let me get back to this. Now, argument three. The New Testament passage assumes the existence of the death penalty, but doesn't take a position one way or the other. Romans 13 comes closest to speaking on the state's authority to execute, but refuses to, but it refers to the state's authority, not the obligation. This is consistent with the position that states are permitted, not mandated or prohibited, the use of this sanction. I'll give an other example. When Jesus confronts Pilate, Pilate says, I have the power to have you put to death. Jesus responds not by saying, well, the death penalty is immoral. Jesus responds by saying, you only have the authority given to you because God has put you in this position. The state gives you this authority. Jesus is not saying the death penalty is wrong, but rather, Pilate, you can only do this because you have the authority as Roman governor. It's the same thing. They, it's almost like, rec it's, it, people like to take the argument of slavery. The Bible in the New Testament is neither pro-slavery or anti-slavery. It just exists, and we have to live with it. But in Paul's letter to uh, Philemon, who was, a, who was a slave owner, yeah, sl slave owner, I always confuse Philemon and the name of the slave who escapes me. Paul says, there was a Christian, Onesimus, isn't it? Onesimus. Onesimus is the Christian slave who runs away from his owner Philemon, who's also Christian, and he comes to Paul, and Paul says, go back, but Paul sends this letter with him saying, you know, it's not, I can't command you. In other words, this is not something that is a clear, not commandment, but it's better, thus the moral choice not to hold this man in slavery or to punishment for his action. So what the argument people are raising is that in the New Testament, the state of executed people, the state had that authority and that right. And Jesus and Paul are writing where that that's authority exists. It's part of the world. But it's always the better choice to err on the side of mercy and discretion. So that's that argument. Now, under what conditions is the next issue? Those who believe the scripture is in favor of the death penalty must move on to another question. When? What condition? The Old Testament does not simply address the whether, but also speaks the how. These provisions need not literally be carried out for our death penalty statutes to meet biblical standards. For example, Deuteronomy 17 required the condemning witnesses to throw the first stones. This is impossible today because stoning is not a current method of execution. It would be a... Uh, Firing squad. Yeah, or if, if, uh, mm -hmm. if you saw... If you were one of the witnesses to the guy holding up the liquor store, you and you and you were there and gave the evidence that convicted him, and he shot the clerk, and it's going to be die. You're the one, and have to go up to Stark, and you, you're the one that pulls the switch to send the jolts through him in the electric chair. We don't do that. We don't do that. So we we don't follow the Old Testament model by any means. However, the principle is that the witnesses were held responsible for the consequences of their testimony. That's a big statement because remember the Ten Commandments are not ordered of this is more, number eight is more important than number five. And then, thou shalt not kill, and thou shalt not bear, thou shalt not bear false witnesses are on par. <clears throat> and that's why in our Western legal code. If you perjure yourself such that a person goes to their execution, you are guilty of a capital crime yourself. If you perjure yourself in a death penalty case, and it's found to be that you deliberately lied on the stand in order for that person to go to jail, it is as it, to, to be executed, it is as if you put a gun to their head and shot them. That your legal responsibility is as a murderer. So, thou shalt not bear false witness is on par. So, proportionality. 
Exodus establishes that the punishment must be proportional to the crime. The sanction of death should only be considered in the most serious of offenses. This is an eye for an eye, a tooth for a tooth. Um, it, to us, that sounds rather harsh. But in that day, in that time, that put an end to what we would today call vendettas, of escalation of violence. You slap me, I punch you, I knife you, I shoot you. You knife me, I shoot you. No, stop that. Certainty of guilt. Before a murder could be executed, two witnesses had to confirm his guilt. And this is a very high standard. The Bible says nothing about circumstantial or DNA evidence. Intent. Numbers establishes that the capital punishment could not have been imposed when the offender did not act intentionally. You've got to be premedicated. You've got to mean to do it. You cannot. It could just have happened. Uh, a fist fight, a traffic accident, whatnot. Due process. Ensure that execution took place only after appropriate judicial proceedings. There were no lynch mobs. It wasn't whether the accused was guilty, but whether he had a fair chance to prove his innocence. Reluctance to execute. Although the law may sound bloodthirsty, it was also applied with great restraint. In Ezekiel, God laments, As sure as I live, I take no pleasure in the death of the wicked, but rather that they turn from their ways and live. The lawgiver himself was reluctant to impose a death penalty, preferring that the wrongdoers repent. Reluctance is not refusal but it does imply that the execution should be a last resort, and as Ezekiel 33 suggests, repentance or contrition could commute the death sentence. Now what follows then are the evangelical statement, the, uh, the Catholic uh, thing, and it's sort of a conservative Catholic response saying the Pope has got it wrong on making the death penalty immoral. So those are just background issues, but what I, what I want to focus on basically, is the conclusion that I, you know where my heart is in this. You've heard me talk, and I can't really shade it. I follow this thing, that I turn to the Bible. What do I think? I think that there are cases when I think the best, that I'm not an absolutist one way or the other. There are what I would consider to be limited circumstances for using the death penalty. I can th we can all think of the extreme cases, but I would rather err on the side of caution. That's just me. That's why I'd probably be struck off with jury by a good uh, prosecutor, because I'm reluctant to execute in every case. But I think what we need to take away from is that this is an individual decision. Now that's difficult for some people because they want, everybody likes to have an infallible source to say, this is what we have to do and I don't need to worry about it. Fortunately, the Bible doesn't work that way in this area. It does in several areas. Jesus gives us commandments to love and honor and this and that. He doesn't say, you must vote for the death penalty, you must do this and that. That's why we can, as Episcopalians, be part of a one group of people that have people over here and people over there. I may think those people are nuts, those people are nuts too. But... If so long as we're under the principle of seeking God's truth and will, I think, I may be naive, and I certainly am in a lot of things, I think that's the best way forward. So my personal, personal belief is that the death penalty can and should be used, but I would advise it to use it sparingly as a last resort. In this day and age, I don't think a death penalty frightens some hopped-up 18-year-old who's you know, full of uh, drop, drop, and who wants to hold up a liquor store and he fires his gun. I really don't think he has any fear of anything. So a death penalty is a deterrent. But to a man my age, that's a deterrent. You know, if I'm going to commit a crime, I worry about the consequences. And if I know I could be executed for it, I'm less likely to do a crime. You know, when you're more mature and sober. But, you know, the brains of 18-year-olds and 20-year-olds are different from brains of people my age. So where do you all, so you sort of seem, so my purpose, let me just state again, my purpose is not to give you a 
this is what we think, but rather to lay out how I hope you approach this issue. Um, the reason why I picked it, because the Pope has been talking about it, and we've had all this sort of Supreme Court stuff, so law has been in the uh, air. But I want you all to think, as, I, as we as rational, adult, thinking human beings, how do we come to address issues? They don't need to be the death penalty. It could be abortion. It could be homosexuality. It could be, you know, all these issues that are destroying, uh, roiling our society. They have direct biblical roots in which we can address them and find a way forward. Do you think I'm screwy on this, or what do you, what do you all think? I no, my thought is that I've struggled with it myself. And a lot of it has to do with the Old Covenant, the New Covenant, the Old Testament, the New Testament, Jesus' forgiveness, confession and repentance, and all these types of things. But what I know you say frequently, and I also say, is we need to delve deep into Scripture to use that as a background, hopefully coming up with a decision that fits into the amount of time and study and prayer, also important, and put into it. So, you know, it's difficult to come up with a definitive, definitive answer because, as you know, probably better than I do, people that want to criticize Scripture, you can point to 650 contradictions in Scripture. So it takes a lot of study and insight on any of these questions. Well, my sermon this morning and my sermon at 10.30 is going to be on the topic of divorce. And I have particularly strong views on divorce. Um, I'll give you some pastoral examples. I once, I very, very seldom get angry. I get angry, but I, it's usually where I'm with my children issues, in fact. But I once had a uh, parishioner tell me that he was going to divorce his wife because she had end-stage dementia. He was a very wealthy man, and he provided for her, and he had been, he had a girlfriend, and he, you know, basically was going to, and, I, and I, I, I really got angry. I didn't yell or anything, but I said, look, you know, that's not one of the biblical reasons for getting divorced. You're married to that woman for better or for worse, rich or poor, sickness and health, not because it's inconvenient for you at this time and because you have the hots for your secretary. I mean, that is, I believe, an immoral act. Well, he went to the Presbyterian Church after that, but, um, I mean, I, so, but then there have been times when I've said to, i said to one woman, you need to leave your husband and divorce him because if you don't, he's going to kill you. Because she was in a, an abusive relationship where he was, you know, she would walk into doors seemingly every Saturday night because on Sunday morning she'd come to church with black and blue marks. And, you know, and I finally got to know, you know where I'm going. So, you could say I'm wishy-washy on divorce because on this example, not in your life, pal. On the other, run and call a lawyer. Because this sounds silly, but I... At the end, of, and on the marriage issue, and I know this sounds, I can say this guy's been married for 35 years, but there are times when you're going to be unhappy, and that's just not a good enough reason for him to toss it all away. Um, yes? I'm going to take it back to capital punishment for one minute. Good, because I'll think, get in trouble if I go I know, and I, and I think of the uh, two thieves on the crosses beside Jesus. And they knew that their hour had come. And one accepted Christ and was with him in paradise that same day, and the other didn't. And that's probably how our, our, uh, the inmates that are on death row are thinking about it, if they know when the date is. So my takeaway is to find out who's on death row, because I can't change it doesn't, matter. it doesn't matter what my opinion is on capital punishment. I'm not going to change it. Um, but what I can do is to pray for at least one of those individuals that's on death row, that they come to know Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior before that date arrives. We used to have a Kairos ministry, the prison ministry. It's been discontinued because the warden won't let us back in anymore. 
they had, a, they had somebody brought in a cell phone and it was pinched from okay. them. And, but I don't have to go to prison to do that. I can, no, but I'm saying, it, yeah. you know, in going to that, one of the things I chain is, is don't ask why they're there. Just don't ask why they're there. Just mm -hmm. pray for them as people as yes. they are today. Friends, I need to change my undershirt mm -hmm. before the next show. Thank you for that detail. Thank you. <laughs> and 